Welcome, everybody. I'm so excited today. Dr. Dan Siegel is here to talk about brainstorm uh, for our, our adolescents with progressive diseases. Um, I just want to do a brief intro and then give as much of uh, the time that we've got to Dr. Siegel himself. He's way more interesting than I am. Uh, we are uh, family friends in Duchenne, and uh, we focus on the relationship part of Duchenne, how it affects all of us. Uh, we focus on four things specifically, uh, education about Duchenne, what is it? Um, number two, how to keep the individual with Duchenne involved in our social lives. Um, they've got some physical challenges, some behavioral challenges that um, kind of other them from other, other people. And so uh, we just really focus on keeping them included, keeping them in our lives. Um, you know, that social aspect is so important for every single human being. Um, we also focus on uh, education and awareness, uh, how to's <clears throat> about all of our other relationships. Um, Parents are affected, grandparents are affected, marriages are affected, friendships are affected. It all looks different um, once there's a diagnosis of Duchenne in the mix. So, uh, you know, being aware of that because there's, there are patterns across the board. And then also how do we support each other as we go on this journey? How do we support each other in our grief? Um, so again, we're about relationships. Uh, thank you so much <clears throat> to Sarah McMahon and uh, Doug Levine for being behind the scenes. Y'all uh, help me brainstorm and kind of get ideas together. I'm so grateful for y'all. And then of course, Leona Phyllis, a Phyllis law firm for sponsoring family, friends, and Duchenne. Y'all are awesome. Uh, okay, two more thank yous. Thank you to all of you who are here today who are interested in, um, and helping our adolescents more. This is a tricky, tricky, tough part that um, I hadn't really thought about much. Well, it's creeping up on my radar. My son is 10. Um, so thank you for everybody who's in the same boat as I am to you know, share with, share with me um, in this journey as I, as I learn stuff as a parent of a child with uh, Duchenne. And lastly, Dr. Daniel Siegel, thank you for being here, for um, sharing your wisdom and, and giving us some guidance. This is a really tricky thing. Um, and I want to go into that briefly. Why, why are we even talking about adolescence and, um, you know, progressive diseases, specifically my son has Duchenne. Um, you know, the tricky part of this is, um, you know, hopefully I don't uh, do any spoilers, Dr. Siegel, but uh, <laughs> for the adolescents, um, you know, it's, it's a time of, of flourishing, of creativity, of independence. Uh, and what do you do when you've got all of these brain changes and these developmental needs and this desire for autonomy when you've got a body that's failing you? Um, when it's a time that you actually become more dependent on your caretakers instead of, um, instead of having the opportunities to physically distance yourself and, and go do the fun, exciting things. And, um, you know, it's a, it's a tricky paradox. So how do we as parents, as adults um, in the world support them? And, you know, what are, what are some things that they should know that's going on in their lives so they can navigate that too? Um, so th those are some things that have been on my mind. Uh, also the, the chronic stress of, a progressive disease, you know, how, how does that affect the adolescent um, when they know that uh, their life expectancy is different from uh, their peers, um, their siblings? Uh, you know, how, how do we navigate that and handle that and help them? Um, so I'm excited. <laughs> Give me your answers because I don't have them, Dr. Siegel. <laughs> um, some quick, quick, I just want to tell you how wonderful he is. That's all. I mean, you can read online. I'm just going to do a quick, quick bio. Uh, Dr. Siegel is a clinical professor of psychiatry at the UCLA School of Medicine and the founding co-director of the Mindful Awareness Research Center at UCLA. Uh, Leona, if you can plop in his uh, website there, the Dr. Dan Siegel. Um, he is also the executive director of the Mindsight Institute, an educational organization which offers learning to any and everybody, basically. So uh, if you like what you're hearing here, um, 
please uh, go to his official, uh, the uh, educational website and you can get some specific training there. Uh, he's written about a gazillion books. I think that's the, the approximation, right, Dr. Siegel? <laughs> uh, Brainstorm, Mindsight, Whole Brain Child. Oh, I love that. That was the one that got me hooked on you, Dr. Siegel, years ago. Uh, and then Parenting from the Inside Out. So uh, I'm done talking. Let's turn it over to Dr. Siegel. And um, thank you, everybody. Thank you for being here. Thank you so much for that introduction, Lindy, and thank you for all of our sponsors. And it's a real honor to be here with you. Um, what I'd like to do is make this as interactive as possible um, and really think deeply about um, the inner experience uh, and how to optimize um, what's going on in the lives of everyone, in family, friends, and Duchenne, what we can do to really think about these things. Um, you know, I'm actually gonna, I'm on a walking desk, but I'm gonna pause it because um, uh, it may be uh, in this moment, just helpful uh, for me not to be moving back and forth as I see my image so big. Um, you know, the questions, Lindy, that you're asking about, you know, how do we go through the stages as a parent or a grandparent or a friend who's an advocate for the families um, and the individual who has Duchenne. And as we know, it's usually boys, but not always. Um, and uh, we know it is a genetic related condition. Uh, I myself used to be in pediatrics. So, um, you know, I have taken care of uh, individuals with Duchenne and also um, know just from the broad pediatric experience, what it means when uh, a, a child or adolescent has a progressive medical condition where um, there may be certain things you can do to support the quality of life, but that life expectancy is shorter uh, and family knows, friends know, and as the individual grows and learns this, it, it does um, become a significant part of what the journey is. So when I switched to psychiatry, it was to try to really um, understand how our minds um, work with life challenges, like Duchenne would be one example, like medical conditions or, you know, psychiatric conditions. And um, so uh, the various uh, approaches that I learned as a psychiatrist were all really interesting, but just to give you a framework of the comments I'm gonna make, I really was, since I was trained as a scientist, I wanted a more scientific approach to the mind uh, to understand relationships, how families can support children and adolescents developing. So um, with my colleagues, we uh, found a way to bring all the sciences together into one framework called interpersonal neurobiology and um, I wrote a textbook for graduate school called, um, for graduate students called The Developing Mind. So if you want the science side of everything, I'm going to say it's in that book, but then people wanted translations for family members or even adolescents themselves. So the various books I've written in addition to The Developing Mind have been for, you know, if you want to call ourselves families or consumers or, you know, the general public. So I have a science group of books and I'm the editor of a series in this field called interpersonal neurobiology which combines all the sciences together we have 75 textbooks if you like reading there's lots to read but I'm going to just get to the point of um, how you take from that science useful uh, things for any of us for adolescents as, as a broad period of life we're going to be focusing on today but also then specifically with um progressive medical conditions like Duchenne's, and we'll talk about Duchenne's in particular. So um, when you look at um, things um, that relate to mental health, in our field, interpersonal neurobiology, and I'll stop saying that because everything I'm going to say is coming from that point of view, you know, we see the mind as both fully embodied, not just up in the head and the brain. So we're going to talk about the brain and the head but the whole body is involved in our mental life as well. So clearly with a progressive medical condition, 
about the body and in Duchenne's where there's muscular weakness that is progressive um, because of the genetic uh, issues leading to the lack of a proper protein for effective muscle functioning. Um, that's no one's fault, uh, but it can present itself, you know, one in 3,500 to 5,000 um, individuals, you know, has Duchenne. So um, it's not super, 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 you know, unheard of, but it's not like a common condition. Even one in a hundred would be someone with schizophrenia or a manic depressive illness. That's, you know, not common, 1% but we're talking about something much less than that, you know, two in 10,000. So um, uh, that's a much smaller percentage. So nevertheless, it's not unheard of, and it's a condition we know about. And unfortunately, as you know, there's no medical intervention uh, directly at this moment. So, um, so the first thing to say is that the mind, our thoughts, our feelings, our hopes, our dreams, our longings, our desires, all of that we're going to put under the word mind. Our mind doesn't just happen in the brain and the head, even though we're going to talk about the brain's changes. It is fully embodied. And so when there is uh, a difference in how the body grows, it's going to affect the mind of the individual. So we're going to talk about that. The second thing to say is that the mind is not just inside of us in our perspective from interpersonal neurobiology, the reason I made up that term interpersonal is because it's not only personal, you have an inner mind, but it's inter, it's in our relationships with other people and our environment. So um, how we relate to others, in quotes, because others are really a part of us, how we relate to individuals besides those in the body we were born into, that is directly not just influencing the mind, it is also the origin of the mind. So uh, relationships are not icing on the cake. They're not even the cake. They're like the main meal. And so we want to really look deeply at relationships because for those of us who are family members um, of chronic medical conditions and full disclosure, I have a family member who has a chronic and progressive medical thing going on. Um, you know, you're, you're faced with, um, uh, as Lindy points out, you know, working with your own emotions, and you've named it, Lindy, as grief. So we're going to talk about that. Um, but to participate fully in a relationship with someone with um, a progressive medical condition, uh, it's really important to, uh, to do it, if you want, if you will, from the inside out. Uh, and, and, and to realize you are a part of the relational mind of the person you care for or care about um, who has this progressive medical condition. So what that means is it, it isn't selfish to do what's called self-care. Uh, and my, my life partner and uh, work partner um, and uh, mother of our children, Caroline Welch wrote a beautiful book, which I recommend to you all called The Gift of Presence, which really, you know, not only helps us during the pandemic, but I think it's helpful for anyone with an individual with in their family or a friend who has a progressive medical condition, because it helps you do that inner work. And Caroline, always, Caroline Welch, the author of that book, um, you know, always reminds us that self-care is not selfish. In fact, it's an important starting point. And from interpersonal neurobiology, it means that, you know, we need to show up fully for a relationship. So um, as background reading then in terms of showing up, two books are I, I recommend to you. Um, I'm a co-author on each of them. One is a book called Parenting from the Inside Out, which is uh, I wrote with Mary Hartzell, um, you know, who also passed away recently of a chronic medical problem. Um, and um, uh, the, uh, the Power of Showing Up, which I wrote with my colleague and um, wonderful co-author, Tina Payne Bryson. Um, so those two books, if you said, well, let me, what, what could I read? The Gift of Presence would be a really important one. And these two books, Parenting from the Inside Out and um, uh, uh, The Power of Showing Up. Now I say those because we're gonna touch on things in this one hour, but you may wanna continue your learning 
And the, so now I don't remember to tell you about those books. Okay, so we're gonna draw on uh, another resource is the book Brainstorm, which Lindy showed you, which, um, you know, I wanted to write a book for adolescents um, themselves. We have a new neighbor next door is 12 and I handed him Brainstorm uh, after he came over to play with our, our uh, new puppy. Um, you know, and, um, and I wanted to write a book because when I looked around what was available for adolescents themselves, there really wasn't much um, uh, useful directly written for adolescents. So therefore that book is written and we as adults can read it, whether we're parents or grandparents or, you know, teachers or therapists or whatever, it's also available to us. So what I want to review for you is how the mind develops across the whole lifespan I'm gonna mention some touchstone points, particularly about an individual who would have a, um, uh, a progressive medical condition and also talk about family members. So we're gonna both talk about what's called typical developmental issues and then what you can call atypical, meaning it's not common. And I, I use these words and you say, why aren't you saying normal and abnormal? Because those words are now banned from our vocabulary as they should be. Uh, and even if we slip and say them, we should correct ourselves. The reason for that is the word abnormal has the feeling or connotation of something is really bad. Oh, that's so abnormal, you know, and the normal is good, but it's really a statistical issue we're talking about that, you know, typical is like, okay, well, that's typical, but atypical could be someone has, you know, an artistic ability that's so atypical and they're making beautiful paintings and you go, wow, that's pretty atypical. So it doesn't have the connotation of that's bad. So that's why now we use the, that, you know, sometimes it feels awkward to say, oh yeah, that's atypical, but it's not common and that doesn't make it bad. Okay, but what it does do is it really um, asks us and let's begin in terms of typical development to say that, you know, a, um, a mother gets pregnant and in the journey in those nine months in the womb, she's gonna be having all sorts of expectations for what this new baby is gonna be like, what the new relationship will be like uh, with her partner. You know, She's gonna think, how's it gonna affect their relationship? How are the two of them and other family members, grandparents, aunts, uncles, friends, how's now this whole family going to be um, uh, relating to this new member of the tribe, if you will. And we have something to start with in terms of those relationships called allo parenting. A-L-L-O means other parenting as a caregiver. And so we as human beings don't just have the mother as the attachment figure. We share child rearing. Um, and you can remember this with, you know, it takes a village to grow a child kind of thing, but that's actually what we are. We're incredibly social as a species. And what that means then is that we need to make sure in modern life that we avoid the misinformation that caring for a baby is the sole responsibility of a mother. It is not. Uh, and yet I've worked with so many um, moms where they think that's true, or they're told there's something called this kind of parenting or that kind of parenting. And if they were strong enough, they would be the sole caregiver. It's just not the case. If you want to see the science of that, there's a book called Mothers and Others by Sarah Hurdy, H-R-D-Y, which shows you the science backing that up. So, so that's the first thing to say, we, we do this together. It's better together. Um, now, as the baby is born, uh, essentially the brain of the baby is going to be shaped by genetic factors in the womb and then throughout the life that shape things like temperament. But experience will start shaping the very structure of the brain in our head. And the way the baby's brain in the head, which I'll just call the brain, but in fact, you have a brain around your heart and a brain around your intestines. So you have three brains and um, these neural networks are what they are that process information are gonna be shaped by both genetic information and by um, experience. So what we do as caregivers, mothers and others, you know, are shaping the structure of the growing brain. So if you wanna think about it this way, you know, in the first, you know, um, 12 years of life, 
the brain is like a sponge and it's soaking in experience and it's really learning and learning and learning by creating what are called synaptic connections, the connections among the basic cells of the brain. And it's laying down something called myelin for skills like the skill of walking or the skill of talking. Um, and in these skills, then it's about synaptic connections and strengthening the way those connected neurons communicate with each other by laying down myelin. Now, you probably know of some chronic conditions uh, like multiple sclerosis, which deteriorate myelin. And depending on the nature of the multiple sclerosis can be a progressive medical condition in some cases. Um, uh, in Duchenne's, it's not, that's not the issue. It, it, you know, it's not a myelin issue. It's not about neural functioning. It's about muscular, a muscular protein that is not able to develop properly. And so the muscles can't function. So that's very different from a neurological uh, issue. But of course, um, as the body of this child is not able to um, carry out a sense of agency because the muscles are failing him, or in some cases her, then that's going to affect the relationship the child has not only with the body itself, but also how this body interacts in the world. So there you see our mental lives being embodied and relational can be affected by a progressive medical condition that's affecting the musculature. So how this individual can develop a sense of trust in their body doing what typically it would be able to do is just a first pausing part for you as a caregiver to realize it's not just a muscle issue, it's going to affect a relationship with the body and a relationship with the world around the individual. Now, because we're social in these first dozen years of life, we're learning how to interact with other kids and we're learning how to you know, trust our parents and other caregivers. We're learning to have what's called attachment and, and it can be secure and not secure. There are lots of things we can talk about that. And you see those in the two books I mentioned, The Parenting from the Inside Out and The Power of Showing Up. But assuming this child now has a secure attachment, you're giving them the love, the connection by, and here's the first acronym we'll talk about today, by playing your part, P-A-R-T, as a care provider. So let's say what part stands for. Part stands for um, being present. And in Caroline's book, The Gift of Presence, you'll see an incredible review of that. Being present basically means I'm showing up and I'm with an open awareness. I'm curious, open, accepting, and loving. This is, I know it's gonna sound strange. This is an acronym within an acronym but that's the COLE acronym for what I think presence means. It's curious, that's C, it's open, that's O, it's accepting of what's there, that's A, and it comes with love, that state of mind. Curious, open, accepting, loving. That is all underneath the first letter of part. So when we're present, we're curious about what's going on, we're open to what's there when we see what's there even if it's atypical like we found out our child has a progressive medical illness we go through a process of grief which is letting go of our prior expectations which were totally understandable with curiosity openness and now acceptance we come to feel in every cell of our body the sadness of that letting go the grief is a letting go of what we thought we had or what we lived into and now living into a new reality that then becomes filled with love, right? And it, if you're just getting the diagnosis in your family, this may sound too ideal to be possible, but I can tell you both personally and professionally, this journey of grief, of identifying the expectations that were there of talking about the anger, the sadness, the fear, not blocking those things, but being curious about them, open about them, accepting about them in yourself and letting the love that you have that got so painful to then find acceptance. Because, you know, whether it happens earlier or later, 
I don't want to shock anybody, but everyone dies. And life is filled with uncertainty. So if there's a, an illusion of certainty, a longing for certainty, a longing for you know, being permanent, a longing for immortality, that's totally understandable. And yet each of those things are just kind of an illusion. It's the, you know, there's, a, there's a poem uh, on, on the um, entry hall of the Brooklyn Public Library by an artist and she writes, um, you know, when I recognize, this is a paraphrase, but when I recognize the, here's the phrase I wanna emphasize, flimsy fantasy of certainty, I decided to wander. When I recognize the flimsy fantasy, that is the illusion, the falseness of certainty, the flimsy fantasy of certainty, the longing for certainty that doesn't exist, I decided, I had agency, I had power to wander. So if we take a moment and pause with that, you know, in typical life, we're consumed by a flimsy fantasy of certainty. And you know, even if your child doesn't have a progressive medical condition, when I work with parents of adolescents who are facing all of the difficulties our world is in and they're struggling to find some kind of way to meet their flimsy fantasy of, cer of certainty, flimsy fantasy of certainty, they are pressuring their kids to you know, do this in school with their grades and do this on their tests and do this in their sports or whatever. And they're driving their kids not only mad, but into suicide. Literally, I went to a school where two adolescents in high school killed themselves. And you can watch this on our website. The students made a video of my coming to the high school and uh, they gave us the video. So you can watch it on our website at Palo Alto High School. It was the saddest thing in the world. They called me because two kids had killed themselves and I had to wait two or three months before I could get there. And when I got up there, two more killed themselves. And so you'll see me talk about this. And I think it's very relevant to Duchenne's because life is full of uncertainty, but if you're clinging to the flimsy fantasy, then you're creating this chokehold on your own heart. And in that chokehold, even with typically developing kids, you can drive them to kill themselves. So when we back up and say, okay, presence of the part we play is this curiosity, openness, acceptance, and love, then you realize all you can do is live in the moment, realizing we're all going to die whenever it's going to happen. It's going to happen sometime, even though we can't predict it. Yes, with Duchenne's, it happens earlier, no question about it. Yes, it affects typical pathways of development, of course. And yet, it is possible for you to develop presence. It's a gift you give to yourself that keeps on giving in ways I'll talk about in a moment. But the A, the A of part, once you work on this curiosity, openness, acceptance, and love, is a, called attunement. And attunement is a word we use in science to mean focusing your attention on the inner experience that's going on. So usually we mean it for interpersonal attunement, like what's actually going on with your child as he's facing his muscles, you know, not working properly. What's his experience? Frustration, sadness, anger. He's mad at you. He's mad at life. He's mad at God. He's mad at the world. Whatever it is, can you tune into his experience? Now, if you're not present, of course, you're not going to want to think he has Duchenne's or any other progressive medical problem. You're not going to want to think he's got muscle problems. You're not going to want to feel his anger and frustration and sadness and the grief he needs to go through. Um, and so right away, you can see if you're not present, it's really going to be really hard to attune to be there with him. Now, when you attune, focus your attention on his or her, in some cases, internal life. What that means is you as a caregiver really need to be ready to feel his feelings. Right. And that's the R, to resonate with what he's going through. And when he feels that you have his feelings inside him, it doesn't mean you become him. 
a, two strings on a guitar. They don't become each other. They influence each other. You feel fully his sadness, his anger, his frustration, but you don't become that anger and that frustration. When he sees that, he has the experience of feeling felt by you. And then what develops is the T of part, trust. You know, and this is the gift you give someone with a progressive medical condition is that you've done your own internal work so you can play your important part, presence, attunement, resonance, and develop trust. So let me briefly go through adolescent brain development to see some of the ways that a progressive medical condition like Duchenne's is going to maybe present itself particular challenges that you can be aware of. So as you can see, I'm an acronym addict. You've already gotten two. Now you're gonna get a third. And I remember I write all my books in this little home office here. I remember when this one came up, I read all of the research I could find on how the brain of an adolescent develops. So in the first dozen years of life, the brain is like a sponge. But in the second dozen years of life, you know, 12 to mid 20s, 24 more or less, the brain is no longer acting like a sponge. Yes, it's learning, 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 absolutely. But now it's doing something that surprised everyone. Now it's remodeling itself with two phases. It starts to prune connections that have been established away in a use it or lose it condition. And then it's going to, after that, create more myelin, this increasing in connectivity among those connections that are remaining. This remodeling can freak out you know, certain adolescents when they hear about it, they go, oh my God, my brain is destroying itself. And that's an extreme way of saying it, but it is true. Like a garden, you know, everything's growing, 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 and you want your garden to be, you know, looking a certain way or have a certain feeling to it, or you want to go through the garden. You have to prune away parts of the, the bushes that are growing and the, the trees that are growing. So pruning is a little different than destroying itself, but it's the same idea. <clears throat> and the thing is, what gets let go, what gets pruned away, can be determined by where the attention of the adolescent goes. So, um, you know, my son is a musician, Alex Siegel, you can listen to his music. When he was 12, he just started playing music, didn't stop playing music. And, you know, he just developed those particular neurons. Now, his friends went on to play soccer and basketball, which he had no interest in. So, you know, that's just not his thing. Those didn't grow. So your child with Duchenne, they may not be able to do stuff with their muscles, but they can do stuff where attention goes, neural firing flows, and neural connection grows. So even if they use their imagination, if they're sports oriented, they can actually develop the athletic circuitry of their brain, even if their muscles can't do it. Studies of athletes who've injured themselves show that's true. So the pruning part of adolescence can be managed by keeping attention active in certain ways. Where attention goes, neural firing flows, neural connection grows, because then you can lay down the myelin that's there. So in summarizing what these remodeling brain changes bring to the child, there's an acronym called ESSENCE. And ESSENCE is the essence of what the brain remodeling period is. So it's a fortunate you know, uh, acronym. The ES stands for emotional spark. So if you do a brain scan on a, let's say a seven-year-old compared to, um, you know, a 17-year-old compared to a 37-year-old, emotions are just more intense. Um, and that's just the way it is. The brain for various reasons needs to have more emotionality to it during adolescence than pre-adolescence or adulthood. And you know that when you go to a restaurant and in the old days when we could go to restaurants and there's a bunch of adolescents at one table and you're with a bunch of adults at another table, like who's having more fun, who's crying more, who's laughing more, the adolescents are. And you may, part of you may want to go over to be with them. And that's just the way it is. So if there's a grieving process going on because an individual with Duchenne's can't be socially engaged, and that's the next SC. So emotional spark is the first one. SE is social engagement. If they can't be engaged because, you know, kids are shunning them because they're not typical in their development, because adolescents and younger kids can do that, then finding a way to have social engagement there can be very, very important to do. Um, you know, so social engagement then can lead to more intense emotions if it's thwarted. Um, and so we need to be ready for that in someone with a, a medical condition. 
Um, and so they can name it to frame it is the new phrase I use to frame it in a narrative uh, because you know you have emotional spark, you have social engagement. You have the next one is N for essence is novelty dash seeking. So I could stick that in without getting another letter in there. Novelty dash seeking. Novelty seeking means there is a tendency for a drive for something new, something that's going to release a substance called dopamine because dopamine levels in their release are higher. So, you know, adolescents can get very restless um, if they, and feeling bored if they keep on doing the same old thing, same old thing. So if you have a muscular condition that's keeping you from getting out in the world or the pandemic that's keeping typically developing kids, all of us from getting out in the world, for an adolescent, it's particularly challenging because their whole nervous system's remodeling, emotional spark, their emotions are more intense and they have to learn to ride the waves of those emotions, which they can learn. In the brainstorm book, there are these great pages that teach them how to do that. Social engagement, they wanna be connected during the pandemic, it's much harder to do, or if you have a muscular issue that's keeping kids not knowing what to how to communicate with you, that can be hard too. The novelty seeking then can also be frustrated. And so understanding that, going through the book, there's an audio version of the book if you want to do it together or you know, each get a copy of the book and read it, you know, this, this would be good to discuss with someone with a, a, a medical condition that's allowing them to realize I am an adolescent and my body, in this case, you know, a muscular protein is not working properly, but I'm still an adolescent and my brain is perfectly intact. So how do you keep that? focus of attention to stimulate the growth of that brain. Because when we get to the final one, CE, creative exploration, what we wanna do is allow this brain to explore things. So um, a dear friend of mine has a bunch of kids and the, the, the last of those kids, you know, was working as a waiter in, in a restaurant and it was a restaurant near a body of water and um, it was really hot in the summer, this was in, in the south uh, of the United States. Um, and, you know, when he was on his break in the restaurant, he decided to go for a swim. So he runs out, you know, and this really muscular athletic guy. And he, so he dives into the water and he breaks his neck on a sandbar. And this athletic 18 year old uh, became a lifelong now quadriplegic. Um, and yet, he, with his mom's devotion to him, he worked through all the different ways that he has to have chronic people take care of his body's needs. Um, you know, he decided to apply to school. He's very artistic. He developed a kind of a t-shirt company. I, I usually, I should have worn his t-shirt right now, you know, wearing t-shirts. Um, and he would, you know, use his mouth to draw things on a computer tablet you know, that they had set up for him because he's artistic and, and it, now he's in school. Um, but the key thing was how could she be, you know, supporting his creative exploration, CE of essence, um, with this sudden and now lifelong, you know, change in the expectations for a typical certainty uh, this dear friend had to now find a way to do that. And, you know, the, the mind then of this individual had to go through the grieving process, which he has done, fortunately. So he could just say, I, this is the condition I'm in. Now you can imagine someone in that situation would be furious with themselves, would feel uh, anger toward himself, sad, all these things. Of course, he went through those emotions. And the thing about emotions are, they allow you to feel what's going on, be fully present for it. And then once you realize it is what it is, and think about those words, it is what it is. For my friend uh, and for her son, you know, both of their minds would wanna say, it isn't what it is. No, it's not this way. Same with Duchenne, same with any progressive medical condition. It isn't what it is. Well, think about what that does to the minds of everybody to say it isn't what it is, which is whether you call it denial or anger, or, you know. So 
It is what it is. That's what the whole idea is. So let me just review then the emotional spark. The emotion is going to be more intense. And with an atypical thing, whether it's, you know, breaking your neck in a sandbar on a hot day when you're a waiter, um, you know, on a break, or you have a medical condition, you now have a lifelong atypical challenge in front of you. So your emotional spark, yes, it's going to be big. Those waves can be big, but you can learn to surf those waves even if your body can't surf, right? Social engagement, we got to keep connections going. You know, we're fully not only embodied, but relational. And if your body is not working because the muscles aren't working well, well, you can work with that with imagery and do whatever you can with the body, but relationships are an equally important part of what the mind is. So social engagement, those relationships, very, very important. And being out in nature as much as possible, extremely important. Novelty seeking, keeping things fresh and alive if you can. And the digital world would be one way to do that. You know, we do have a virtual world now where you can literally get in goggles. And I don't know if anyone's done that, but to really keep the mind, the brain and relationships, all those things engaged, right? That's the novelty seeking, creative exploration. You know, to be fully present is to realize all we have is the present moment. So even if we have now a change in what the body can do, even if we have a change in how long the lifespan of this body will be, we're all in a limited lifespan experience. We all are. So for us as caregivers who care so deeply about people with chronic medical conditions, our task has got to be to let go of the flimsy fantasy of certainty so we can wander with curiosity, openness, acceptance, and love with those we care so deeply about and literally to show up fully for them with that presence. And the gift of presence is in fact that we can be a guide for them to bring light into their lives. And as we do that, they'll bring light into ours because in the end, it's all about just the present moment. And when we give up our expectations, when we go through that grieving process, we can become fully alive. And some people, as you may know, and I'm not saying anyone wishes for terminal illnesses or chronic medical conditions or someone crashing into a sandbar and breaking their neck. No one's asking that that happen, but those things happen. And when you actually do the research and ask people who got a diagnosis and they have six months left to live, person in their 40s, 50s, 60s, whatever, they often will tell you when they do the emotional work, this was the most meaningful time of my life and I wouldn't trade it for anything. So in a way, that's the invitation that Duchenne's offers us. That's the invitation that really being present offers us to make this the time of our life, no matter how long that time is. You know, um, and it isn't the days in our life, but the life in our days. And that is a way we can live by showing up and truly bringing love and light to our connections. So thank you so much for being here. I will have time now for questions. I, I'm so grateful to have you invite me to have the privilege of being on the journey with you. Thank you so much. Um, thank you, Dr. Siegel, uh, <laughs> was on the verge of tears so many times during that, uh, that was amazing. That was utterly amazing. Um, thank you. uh, yeah, oh gosh, <laughs> I had all these questions and, and I am, I'm just, I'm just kind of stumped right now, right now, digesting everything. Um, I don't know that I've ever been um, at a loss for word in any of these webinars. <laughs> uh, let's see. So you talked about the, um, the age of roughly 12 to 24 for the adolescents. And um, as we know, part of adolescence is preparing for adulthood. Um, 
when you've got a child with Duchenne, there may not be an adulthood. Uh, so how do you explain that and, and guide that? Um, uh, I, I heard you say it is what it is, but I don't know how to explain that to a teenager <laughs> or yeah. a child. Um, could, could you chat a little bit about that? And then I think we've got some, um, some questions rolling in. Yeah, well, let's start, um, you know, Lindy with, uh, first of all, thank you for your, for your presence here in this conversation. Let's just start with a, a, a broader and more typical thing. When any kid learns that they're gonna die, whenever that's gonna be, it freaks them out. And, and then people fall into a kind of a dreamlike delusion. I'm just gonna forget about death. So in many ways, you know, I think the, the notion that, okay, this adolescent is not gonna have an adulthood um, sure, absolutely, that's different than just saying we're all going to die someday. And yet it's also similar. And so part of the challenge is for us as caregivers to really come to that, you know, what's called existential, meaning it's about existence, reality. And so your adolescent is going to push back on you because that's what they're designed to do and say, this is ridiculous, this is stupid, I don't want to talk about this, or you're just making this up, or it's all your fault, or why did you give birth to me? or, you know, I don't want to read that stupid book, or, you know, of course, they're going to do that. So don't be thrown by that. And make sure you are kind to yourself. And don't say I'm failing, there must be a better way to do this. You just have to show up, literally. And I, I tried to do this in the brainstorm book talking from the parents point of view, and just be present, you know, and say, Yeah, this is hard. In, in, in this case, you know, there is a, a genetic issue that none of us knew about. That we can't do something about. And so part of the challenge is, you know, how can you find meaning and purpose in the time that you have and the time we all have? And yes, is yours going to be shorter? I'm not lying to you. Yeah, it is. So let's, you know, how you how you become present in these ways too, uh, and be kind to yourself or others, you know, this is a journey. And, and whether it's, you know, reading books on this, on the idea of being present or, you know, uh, having a therapist support this person or support groups, if, if they're helpful, you know, of kids who, who also have Duchenne's, I don't know if uh, that sometimes is helpful for some, maybe not for others. So it's a part of the conversation, you know, and, you know, I think people who have atypical um, development can be shunned by their peers, especially in child and adolescent, because they're so scared of it. They don't know what to make of it. So the more, um, the more a, uh, an individual can become comfortable with what's called the narrative, the meaning making. Uh, and I don't mean narrative, like make up a fake story. I mean, we are narrative creatures. So how your son will come to tell the autobiographical story of his life makes all the difference you know and people with autism you know it's just one example it may not lead to earlier death but it certainly leads to a, a lifelong challenge in terms of social connection uh and if you read some of the writings there it, it really is about how does a person say it is what it is this is what i've got and um my life will not be what is typically there now th that's not easy for an adolescent and i'm not saying you know, something oversimplified like just have them read a book and yet the conversation can be, if you're ready for it, as deep as that, as, yeah, this is hard. And um, adulthood is not what your adolescence is about. Adolescence is about, for anybody, how do you just show up and be present in this moment? Um, and, you know, that's, you know, that that's becomes the conversation. Thank you so much for that. Um, man, I can't wait to rewatch this recording in bits and pieces. There's so much to digest. You're just, um, thank you so much, Dr. Siegel. Well, you're welcome. I mean, let me say one thing, Lindy, just to build on that. I, I forgot who it was, but uh, a, a, um, a leader once said, you know, there's a difference between a problem to be solved and a condition 
that just needs to be worked with over time where there's no, no, no solution to it. So, so this changes our whole attitude as parents. If, if there's a, this, this is not a problem that has to have a solution. It's a, it's a situation that just needs to be worked with in a beautiful, loving way over time. That will take the urgency out of you that, oh my God, I got to solve the problem. Because of course, as parents, we have that feeling. But when we realize there's no problem here, there's a situation that needs to be worked with beautifully with love and light over time. That can just change your whole experience of how to do the parenting here. Um, <laughs> it's so weird how peaceful I feel right now. Um, <laughs> your, your, your words are, are, are amazing. Um, we have a, a couple questions from um, a parent here, and then I think it'll be time to wrap up and, and we can talk about, um, you know, more ways to, to find you or contact you. Um, but the first one follows on the heels of that. Uh, how do we find more material about um, grief? You talk so beautifully about it, and it's something that we really struggle with in this community. And Personally, I'm trying to get us to a point where the community can come together on webinars like this and, and talk about it because it's, it's this big elephant in the room. Um, and there yeah. are so many different models. So uh, can you tell us where to go for, for some references that, that you really yeah. think are? Uh, absolutely. I may have a naming moment here, um, but I think a, a really powerful book, and I believe it's David Kessler, is his name, but I might be getting the name wrong. It's it's something about something something grief. Uh, um, <laughs> but he was uh, he was a colleague uh, of uh, Elizabeth Kubler Ross, and he added with her legacy, her family legacy's permission, a um, finding meaning. There you go, finding meaning in the sixth stage of grief. That's exactly. Thank you, Leona. Um, you know, and so meaning making is what we said when we talk about narratives, and it's a beautiful book. Um, I can't remember if I just wrote endorsement for it or something else for it, but it's a really beautiful book. And, um, you know, our, I think our whole conversation today is how do we as caregivers uh, not only, you know, find meaning, but it's really cultivating meaning. You know, Caroline in her book, Caroline Welch in, in The Gift of Presence talks about purpose and, and it's, it's a little distinct from meaning, uh, but, you know, but meaning and purpose, they're slightly different, but this, this changes everything. And for our own well-being and the well-being of the children we care for and the adolescents we care for, you know, finding meaning in this, and I don't mean like just excusing it, but, you know, finding the deeper meaning, like, wow, this atypical thing that our family is dealing with has made every day precious. And for so many families, which is just a typical thing, things go away and there's no preciousness to it. There's just pressure, you know? And, and, and I know, I mean, it's sad and there's pain and stuff, but, but our ability to sit with that pain of the grief and allow meaning to be cultivated. I mean, David talks about in his book, you know, um, I, I would I would absolutely support looking at meaning making. I'm, and there are probably other books I'm not aware of. Um, some people are writing them up. I'm not familiar with them, but you know. But really, um, when we talk about the part, the presence, attunement, resonance, and trust, when you play a part for yourself and try to have that call, that curiosity, openness, acceptance, and love, it's about finding meaning, right? And and the story, the narrative, the, the way we make sense of life will be unique for each of us. And yet it's so important to do, so deeply important and liberating to do. When you mentioned earlier that you felt peaceful, you know, what is so empowering, I think, for all of us to hear you, you reflect on that, Lindy, is this is where the same condition, you know, you working with your son and stuff, how you are taking in perspective and making sense of it and having a narrative literally shifts how we feel. And so this isn't just about a temporary, oh, now I'm feeling okay because I got distracted. No, it's actually a deep shift 
in the making sense process. That's, that's what narratives do, is they allow us to live a life of meaning. Um, and that's, that's, I think, what the grieving process is all about. Oh, thank you again. Thank you so much. I'm just going to keep saying that, Dr. Siegel. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you. Um, we have one last just practical question, if we may, and then um, we'll say goodbye and um, let you continue your day with your, your sweet new puppy. Um, the question is, um, somebody has a, a kiddo who isn't naturally curious and he has personal limitations. Um, he's got Duchenne and then he's also got um, some other challenges um, regarding to social interactions. What are some ways that she can help to find or create opportunities for novel seeking when we've got these, these walls? Yeah, <clears throat> and this is an adolescent uh, or a younger child? Uh, yes, and... Uh, an adolescent, he's, he's just starting his adolescent years. Um, and if you wanna jump on, um, Alicia, to explain a little bit more, you're welcome to. Um, he's 13. Okay. Um, well, I mean, in general, what I would say is, <clears throat> you know, this journey into adolescence can be challenging for everybody concerned, you know, and yet uh, an incredible opportunity as well. So uh, Lawrence, Steinberg actually wrote a beautiful book called The Age of Opportunity, which is a sort of a professional complement to the brainstorm book, which is more for families and, and adolescents themselves, but they go really well together. And the idea there is to really see um, things. You don't have to like shove those four aspects of essence onto your adolescence, but find ways like emotional spark, find things that seem to spark kind of an emotional arousal intensity, you know, emotion and meaning go hand in hand in the brain. And so you wanna see what is particularly useful. So I worked with someone who had social cognition challenges once and, you know, um, I had to just really, really be present, attuned and resonant for him. And this was a professional a therapeutic relationship, but, you know, he ended up being really emotional about cooking. So we did a lot of things around food and, you know, if we didn't, if I wasn't kind of trying to tune into where is that emotional spark in him, I would have missed it. And not every adolescent is interested in cooking, but he was, and he's actually now a great cook. Um, so that would be one thing, the social engagement as best we can, you know, even just depend, you know, some kids with social cognition challenges, they can only take, you know, 30 seconds of social engagement, then they need to go off on their own. So you really want to measure, you know, um, a kind of window, what I call a window of tolerance. So engage, engage, and then when they go past that window through a threshold, either into chaos or rigidity, and Tina and I talk about this in Whole Brain Child and Yes Brain and uh, probably No Drama Discipline and The Power of Showing Up, all those books, um, you know, um, what you want to do is try to stay present with them in social engagement, but not flood them. And the novelty seeking is, it may be subtle. It doesn't have to be, you know, I'm going on a big roller coaster. It could be, I'm now going for a walk to the end of the block, you know, and that was my novelty for the day and that's okay. Or I'm looking at, you know, a bug on the ground when I'm kind of scared of bugs, whatever it is, you know, you can, you can do that. And that's the novelty seeking and the creative exploration like this kid with the cooking, you know, it was finding what he was passionate about and then allowing that to, to blossom, right? So that you may you may think there isn't this curiosity, but y you can um, you can you know work in all these ways, um, you know, to really be playing your part, your presence, attunement, resonance, and the trust that's there. You know, uh, he's going to really feel what that connection provides for him. So initially, it's a safe haven, but then it's a launching pad. You know, and that's kind of the dual role we play, you know, a safe harbor or a safe haven, you know, when there's distress or just wanting comfort, but then in whatever ways is particular for this child, a launching pad for him to go out into the world. Oh, wow, Dr. Siegel. Uh, thank you so much. <laughs> I told you I was going to keep saying thank you. <laughs> <laughs> You're welcome so much. Thank you, Lindy. Thank oh, you. Oh, gosh. Um, thank you for all your leadership and thank everyone for being a part of this and 
you know, it's better together. This is something we can all put our, our whole selves into and, you know, realize every day is precious and we can relieve the pressure on ourselves and just try to show up this day, you know, and that's, that's a way we can do it. That's amazing. Um, you're wonderful. <laughs> thank you. Well, thank you. Our, our Dushan community thanks you too um, so much, so very much. My honor to be here with you. And let me know if I can be of any other support. Most definitely. Have a thank good one. Thank you so much. Thank you. Be well, everyone. Thanks.